Oh, no. You're basically getting pushed down to like 20 meters deep. There's so much pressure on top of you from the wave before and after. Literally, you feel like you're just going to black out. Surfing is a mental game. It's just you against the ocean. And you can prepare yourself the best you can. But at the end of the day, you're at the mercy of the ocean and it can do whatever the f it wants. Just absolutely beauty. This is Kai Lenny, the youngster from Maui. A big reason why I do this is, is for my family and you know to support them. Thanks, T. Um, look, I think I might have met a number of you. I've been involved with the program for about three or four years. Um, but I had the opportunity to meet Ryan. He uh, actually, much as it will look like it to you, uh, to you folks, uh, I used to surf. I think the biggest surf wave I've been on is about 10 foot. And so when you multiply that by about eight or 10, it puts it in awe. Uh, I've also had a son that did the tour a couple of years behind Ryan. Um, and I can't tell you how highly regarded he is, but I came across, across him about 18 months ago, somebody introduced me to him. So I spent a bit of time together just uh, getting him into the frame of what you folks are about and what, uh, what you know, the challenges are that you're facing. Um, so just as a, as a real brief intro on him, um, when you look at what was going on there, and he didn't pinpoint which was his wave, but you know, some of those waves are driving him 60, 80, 100 feet underwater. Um, you might wonder what it is that he's thinking being there, but he's actually concentrating on much more fundamental matters. Breathing, maybe. Survival, maybe. Um, what's interesting is as a, a skinny little runt growing up on the Gold Coast, he was shit scared of big surf, which I relate to. I think it's a very human response. Um, but then at the age of 14, he found himself in Hawaii, which is by any measure one of the, the big wave meccas of the world. So it's fair to say he had to grow up pretty damn quickly. Um, and you look at that and you go, hmm, 
how would I have reacted on those responses? Um, he almost drowned five years ago, and that acted as a catalyst where, for him to change a lot of things in his life. Um, he changed the way he set his goals, his mindset, his preparation, his equipment, his team, uh, and he'll, he'll talk about that today. Um, today is certainly recognised as one of the, 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 the top elite uh, big wave servers on the planet. Um, and uh, having spent a fair bit of time with him over the last uh, couple of months particularly, um, there's a lot of leadership attributes that he does, he's not aware of that I see in him uh, that I reckon you can take out of it today. Um, but look, we're, uh, we're going to run a slightly different format today, uh, but I'd really like you to put your, your hands together and welcome Ryan Hipwood. We thought the first part, we thought we'd run in two parts. First one, gonna, next sort of 30 or 40 minutes, uh, just do an informal interview. Uh, Teague's is going to run. Um, as Ryan just said to me a moment ago, it's a bit different than the last interview he did, which was on Fox Sports about two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, I was at Fox. Little, 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 little different. Yeah. <laughs> Compete with Fox Sports. I can't even get on my, yeah, well, I can't even get on well, my chair. Yeah. You haven't had a job, Teague's. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, yeah, hey Grant, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. So Ryan's come down from Queensland to be with us tonight, so flew in today, it's pretty special. We're very lucky to have him here with us. Um, I guess I must admit, although I was a bit of a kneeboarder in my surf club days, I definitely am probably relating a little more to you guys, uh, the participants in the room, than Ryan over here. Um, so I guess what we do and what you do is pretty different, would you say? For sure. I mean. I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, I've got a good, I went to school or, you know, obviously the ocean is my school and I've learned a lot of stuff through that, life experiences and, and whatnot. But, um, yeah, hopefully from my story, you guys learn, you know, a little bit about what the parallels that you can take in your own profession. And um, all I can do is tell you my story and what I've been through and I hope that you guys can take something from that. No, awesome. Um, I think that's awesome because for me, when I think of concepts like resilience, I kind of understand it to mean things like going through a bit of a, a grueling or a negative or a tough experience and you kind of come out the other side and you're better for it. You've learned something for it. Um, and while it may be a little less life and death for us in those kinds of experiences than for you, I think we've probably had some of those experiences ourselves in our own um, lives and and workplaces and things like that where we've been through something tough and we've come out the other side better for it. So I definitely think there's still some parallels even though we're, as you said, worlds apart. So I'd like to delve a little bit more into your story so everyone who can get to know you a little better, if that's okay. Um, for sure. What's been your journey so far? So the story so far, I grew up on the east coast of Australia, the Gold Coast. Um, we get shit waves. As far <laughs> as Hawaii goes, it's tiny. Um, I wanted to be a professional surfer. Uh, everything that I wanted to do growing up was around being a professional surfer. Um, didn't go to school much, hung out with the wrong crowd a bit, and that was my escape. The ocean was what I wanted to do, and um, I was gonna do anything it took to become a professional surfer. I actually grew up around some of probably household names, if you know anything about surfing, Mick Fanning and Joel Parkinson and those sort of guys. The problem was is that I sucked in small waves. I was bloody terrible. <laughs> like, um, but when the waves got bigger, I'd get better results. And then I was lucky enough when I was 14 to get an opportunity to go to Hawaii, which is the mecca of big wave surfing in the North Shore. Um, you know, every second day, the waves are 15, 20 feet. And um, I was over there by myself and got mentored by an older guy over there that was a really good waterman. and. Um, and he basically just taught me about the ocean and a lot of life skills that he, you know, obviously nurtured into me, which was, you know, I, I feel like the, uh, you know, the base of, you know, what I've used and learnt throughout my career to date. Um, and so, yeah, I had an opportunity to com compete as a junior and I was top 10 um, in the country for, you know, two, three years and saw a lot of friends that were trying to basically get to the top on the tour. There's a regular tour, and then there's now a big wave world tour that I'm actually currently on representing Australia, which I'm pretty proud of because there's only two of us at the moment. Wow. Um, and then so from that, I had friends that were trying to obviously get onto the regular tour, which Kelly Slater and stuff's on, and um, I went the other way. I, went, I, I could see a, a niche in 
becoming like being young, having a competitive edge, and, and chasing big waves. And so that's what I did, and um, it's been a hell of a ride. Can, can I chime in with a question? You talked about this um, guy, person in Hawaii, that the waterman. Yeah. What What do you reckon it was that he saw in you, or you saw in him? I just I, the parallel for, for a lot of you guys. People talk about mentoring, coaching, sponsors, all that sort of stuff. I'm kind of interested in what that because at, at 14, that's that's a pretty big call. It's a, obviously yeah. it was a big opportunity, but I, I, it's some, maybe something that you guys might be able to relate to. Is what what starts that chemistry, if you like? Well, you're right. I mean, without him, you know, there's that trip would have been shit because. <laughs> No one else was going to do it. Yeah, no one else was, was um, looking out for you, right? No, no. And I was, you know, like I was a kid. So um, to meet him was just, it was luck for one. But obviously, looking back at it now, I can see the value that it was to yeah. be surrounded by someone like that at an early age yeah. to put me in the right direction. And um, yeah, it's funny. I think once you get to a certain point in your career, you can reflect and look back and say, well, you know, um, you can, these little things kind of stick out a lot, you know, mm. so, yeah. So you got to go to Hawaii, met this amazing mentor, you kind of realised, hey, there's a niche here, I'm going to go for it. Yeah. What actions then did you take to be like, okay, no, this is, this is it? Well, that's the thing. You know, once I saw it, the blinkers were on, nothing else mattered. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to, you know, I had one thing in mind and that was just to be the best big wave surfer on the planet. Um, the problem that comes with that though is a lot of things. Um, you're not living in the moment. I was feeding off this negative energy that I knew that would work and I was out to prove a point to my peers, myself, that I, I was the best. But the problem is you get into this frenzy and, you know, I was young. Like I said, I was out to prove something. Um, yeah, you look back at it, I look back at it now, and obviously, you know, I've had to go through some changes. Yep. I'm 33 now, I've got kids. And, um, you know, that period of just chasing something and having no other, nothing else that mattered really, um, kind of took its toll and I mm -hmm. hit breaking point at one point because, um, yeah, I, I nearly drowned. and. I had, you know, friends around me that were, um, you know, getting really injured and, you know, it just got to a point where decisions were getting harder to make because I knew, obviously, that the decisions that I was making to go on these trips could obviously end my life. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was tough. At, at, it wasn't tough because, obviously, that's what I wanted. And once I started achieving it, it was great. But it just, for the longevity of it, it kind of took its toll. Mm. And then you hit breaking point at some point, and that's what happened when I, I basically drowned. Went to a location in Western Australia, and um, yeah, just wasn't prepared. Um, didn't really care. Just you know, wanted to get the biggest wave, and didn't take care of any safety precautions. Had a friend, had a guy that I didn't really know driving the jet ski. We have to have jet skis to tow us into these waves because you can't physically paddle into them. Um, and so I just overlooked so many things that almost cost me my life, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I think when you get older, you kind of understand where reflect you've gone wrong that. and you get to reflect and obviously make better decisions because <laughs> you have to. I mean, there's, guys, and feel free to um, jump in. We'll have, we'll have stops on the way for Q&A, of course, but if there's something that Ryan's saying and you're like, what what does that even mean or you have something else that you want to please chime in and ask um there's kind of two key things that came out of that for me is one you're you're saying you had this goal and you pursue it and it literally got to a point where it was life and death um so two things out of like one is, isn't that kind of crazy to be so committed to this dream of being the best that you're actually willing to <laughs> risk your life for it i don't i mean we're all pretty career driven we're doing these kinds of programs but i I don't know if anyone else in the room would be like, yep, I'm actually going to put my life on the line today. Like, it's more yeah, of a yeah. saying than a reality. <laughs> yeah, looking back at it now, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I st I'm still surfing for, for a living. Yeah. Um, but my mentality now from then is a lot different. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think at one point there, I was like, I didn't really give a shit about that. Yeah. Because I was so driven and 
just so locked onto that one goal. Um, Did you think about it? Yeah, I thought Not about it. Not care about it, but I'm yeah. wondering where you actually, mm. actually thought about it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I thought about it a lot. I had a lot of people reminding me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Constantly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, right. I mean, it's just, you have to be, you, you kind of had to have an element to you like that, to be, I guess, competitive enough at that early stages without having the, no the knowledge and competing against older guys that had the knowledge. And, you know, um, coming from Australia, we, we didn't really have anyone that was knocking on the door. Um, you know, Hawaii is this whole place. Like, that's what guys do there. They live to surf these sort of waves. And I was just some kid from the Gold Coast. Yeah. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was, um, it was interesting, for sure. But, um, yeah, I, I guess the whole thing is around resilience, right? So yeah. when you said, you know, come talk about resilience, I had to think about it a lot because, for me, it's a... People throw that word around quite, quite easily, and I feel like it's a long-term thing. It's not. Mm -hmm. You can't just be resilient for two months and go, oh yeah, tick. They like, actually uh, run resilience courses, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, for me, resilience is a is a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. It ain't something that you tick the box for two months and go, oh, I was pretty resilient that month. But <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. So. Yeah. Right. Was, was that a bit off topic? I'm not no, sure. no, no, no. no. From, from, these guys judge that one. Yeah, yeah. All right. um, probably a little bit, I know I'm probably now getting off topic, but it's interesting to kind of set the context. I guess for us, we, you know, we're working on our goals, we're working on a job, we rock up at kind of 8.30, 9 a.m., we have a set amount of tasks that we do, and we go home, and within that day, we've progressed. Like, what's a day in the office like how do you just walk down to the beach or are you like oh that's a big wave i'm gonna get a jet ski to it like how yeah, does so it work it's not as humpty dory as it sounds yeah like i'm not getting paid crazy money to surf big waves like the tour guys get paid top five guys get paid shit loads of money but you know i've been through work i've been a tradesman you know i've done all these things that normal people have to do um you know i started the first ever big wave event here in Sydney mm. from off the back of a pizza box. And I just went into it with the same determination as what I did with my surfing career. Yeah. And I went into a law firm and just said, this is my idea. Um, obviously had some money and basically just implemented, I just put it on the table and just said, this is my idea, this is what I want to do. Went to Red Bull, went to Monster, and they had a bit of bidding war for it, and it ended up being, you know, something that still runs today. We're doing one down in Tasmania, but um, yeah, I, I feel like I just took the same <coughs> steps as what I did with surfing and implemented that into, you know, that sort of part of my life. Uh, was that an event or something? You did yeah, 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 it's a big wave <coughs> surfing event. So the, uh, you might have seen it in the news about two years ago. It was at Botany Bay. It's called the Rebel Cape Fear event. Bunch, bunch of lunatics surfing this wave real close to the rocks and um, yeah. carnage everywhere. But yeah, so that was me and my, Mark Matthews is my, one of my best friends who I also do this big wave surfing stuff with. Um, and so w there wasn't enough for big wave surfers and especially the younger guys coming up. You know, we wanted to give back to the sport a bit. Um, we got looked after obviously by sponsorship through the peak of our careers. And I was like, Mark, we, you know, we need to bring the sport bigger, in, like make it bigger in Australia. And, and so we set out to do that. And um, it was the highest prize pool for a one day surfing event ever. And um, yeah, I still look at it today and just go, how the hell did I pull this off? But um, that was a proud moment, I was stoked. And um, it's still running, so yeah. It, it's actually an interesting one, one of the things, um, Ryan and I were talking about in the preparation of this was the fact that he and Mark um, kind of had to break in. The, traditionally, the big wave surfing tour is dominated by Europeans and uh, South Americans and Hawaiians. And he said, well, well, the waves here we have are different. And what do you call them, slab? Yeah. Yeah, so they're called slabs because basically we've got huge shelves and then the waves that, the big waves that break around Tasmania and Western Australia, they hit these shallow they hit these shallow uh, pieces of reef and basically just go completely square. We've got, 
it's a, it's, they call it slabs because there's a big slab of water breaking in shallow water. Right. And um, so we got labelled slab surfers because we had to use jet skis to get into these waves. And the Hawaiians didn't like it because they're traditional, they like paddling in. Yeah. Um, so we had to adapt and, and we had to basically start paddling in to get recognition to get our spot on the tour. Right. And, um, but the thing is, when, when they came over for the event, they realised quite quickly how hard it is to right. actually surf the waves we've got here because all the locals that were in our event here uh, beat every single international. And some of those guys were, you know, blue col collared workers, yep. and miners and stuff like that. And it was just, uh, it was cool to see. So in some ways you guys kind of changed the game? For sure. Yeah, definitely, yeah. through Australia. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Now, I don't mean to... Oh, sorry, was that a question? No, I don't, don't want to I keep bringing you back to the whole um, you nearly died from drowning. <laughs> but yeah. um, I know when we were chatting, you said that you've got a clip. Do you mind if we kind of show these guys yeah, sure. what it is you're talking about? Yeah, awesome. It drags on a little bit, so... If you, yeah. Oh, everyone likes to wipe out play it through. <laughs> <laughs> Just maybe Sweet. mute it, because I think there's... Mute it. Commentary behind it. Okay. Yeah. Let's press this one. Here. Oh, okay, cool. Take two. Let's see how I go. Just while Teague's is queuing that, so second part is we're just going to dive in and get you to spend a little bit of time interacting at tables with Ryan afterwards, just around resilience and wellbeing specifically. So the you know we'll probably run for about another half hour in this interactive format and then dive into that. So this is the guy that I said. I didn't really know that well that was driving the jet ski. And these are the wipeouts that happen. Where, where is this? This is, the, this is actually a wave that me and Mark helped discover in WA through Google Earth. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty wild. How big is that? Like, um, like height? It's not so much how high it is, it's how much water and oh, velocity is yeah. in it. Um, that wasn't the long hold down. The next wave was the long hold down, but um, obviously being in that state, like I mentioned before, um, now if this happened to me, I'd go back to the boat, I'd analyze what happened, and then figure out, is it the conditions? Is it my board? What, what's going on? Um, I probably would have changed drivers, but because I was young and stupid, I jumped back on the road, and the next wave was a nearly a minute hold down which is a long time underwater. <laughs> 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 it's not like a bathtub. You know, yeah, it's a bit different. Yeah, right. Were you issues with the driver? He just wasn't experienced at that location. You just can't rock up. Even like, you know, a V8 supercar driver, if they haven't been to a track, they could be the best driver in the world, but they're not gonna uh, they're not gonna compete with someone that's obviously, you know, still up there and, and, and has, you know, obviously been to the track and got used to it before. So it's the same sort of thing as this. So he's but just not reading it well, not putting yeah, you in the back position. The elements always change though too, <laughs> at locations and stuff. So the seat shoes, I guess, like what waves you ride or when you drop in or yeah, exactly. So it's it's a real team event. Um, you know, you've got to have a lot of trust in your driver, and you've also your driver can see stuff before you. He's elevated on the jet ski, so he's almost making the decision before you even see the wave. If he makes the wrong decision, it's usually on him. If we look at your face right there, right now, do you know that this is a muppet next to me? Is that what you're thinking? Because <laughs> that's I mean that's the answer to the, that question you just asked. Well, you, you've got no confidence in this guy at all. Did you know it that then? I had confidence in him. Right. But I was, I was too caught in my ways and thinking about catching the biggest wave because my mate just caught one earlier in the morning. Yeah. And all I could think about was beating him. So he's tapping his watch there. What's he saying? Uh, is he saying I need to go and get breakfast? Or is he <laughs> saying I, I think this guy's got to go, go, go to the bench? I can't really recall. I don't think yeah. it's kind of... Yeah, I'm not sure yep. to answer your question, but... Um, so how, how long ago was this? How old were you there? This was five to six years ago, yeah, like so you mentioned before in the, yeah. in the bio. 25, 26. Yeah. Old enough to know, know this better. This is basically when the change started occurring. Yeah. I was just like, 
you know, I, I definitely had to think about why I was doing this. And, um, you know, my wife at the time, we just got married and she was, she was getting pretty over it. Was she here that day? Um, no, she wasn't. She has been there though for a documentary that we're shooting. Okay. Um, and we'll sh I'll, sh I'll play that a bit later. So is this, this is the long so one, is it? Yeah, this is in that, this is when I was in that phase of basically tunnel vision. Um, it was coming to that point where I knew that change was supposed to be coming. Like I, I knew I couldn't keep going this way. But this is kind of like <coughs> the camel that broke the straw, you know, it's just kind of over it by this stage. And I'll show you, at this point we didn't have, we've got a safety device now that you can actually um, yeah. sit behind you, I think. You sit? Yeah. Yep. So this is what, this is like the latest version. And it's basically a bladder inside our wetsuits. And at this stage, um, they were just an impact vest, like, like a thicker version of what wakeboarders use and stuff. And they basically don't do anything. The force of the water pushing down drives you too deep. And that's why we're getting such long hold down. So it came to a point where we're all, we all got together and just said, you know, we, we've got to come up with something that's going to help us shoot to the top. And, um, you know, at the, at the, yeah, that was probably around the 55 second mark. Um, and I didn't really have much energy to jump on the ski at that point. I actually blacked out two feet from the surface. That's, that's pretty much it of the video. Um, and so we've come up with these. I'm not sure. I've got, the, I've got a few canisters in here to show you. But I'm not sure which, which ones are in. Now I'm screwed. <laughs> it's to go off. You're drowning. I'm drowning at the moment. So it, it goes. That the Is that the idea? That's the idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when we fall off, we pull that yep. and it shoots us to the surface. <coughs> and that's got a lot of air. That's a small canister too. They go twice as big as this. Yeah. So this has been a game changer. Since this has come out and we helped develop it um, through Aqualung, who do all the scuba diving um, buoyancy stuff, there's been an increase of big wave surfers by about 30%. Um, were the original cowboys that didn't have them. And now every young kid will see a big wave surfer and you'll see a whole lineup full of red vests. So I don't know if we've created a monster or whatnot, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's good. It's good for the sport. And um, yeah, it's good to kind of give back and make sure that people go home and make the sport safer. Yeah, I was about to say, you must have had experiences with other people, mates who've been in a similar situation. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, plenty. Okay. Um, I've had to help revive a mate that drowned and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, not fun, no. but it's all part of it, and um, it's a learning experience too. You've got to learn from your mistakes. Oh, well, that's the whole quickly. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get we don't get many chances to make mistakes. No, nah, not many second chances. There was no. a Netflix documentary floating around a couple of years ago about big. The yeah. Big waves, and I think there was a South African kid who died. Was that? Uh, no, Jay, Jay Moriarty drowned. Yeah, maybe that's yeah, yeah he's um okay. he's from San uh, San Francisco oh, yeah. near yeah, Half Moon yeah. Bay at Maverick. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been a couple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've had mm -hmm. two friends pass away from surfing big waves. Yeah. So it's a fair fair fatality rate, huh? Mm. High risk. Yeah, yeah, it's high risk for sure. But since these have come out, no one's. No one's drowned. Right. Yeah. But that's a span over my whole career, you know. Um, yeah. But still, it's not great. It's, still <laughs> it's, so, it's not like construction or mining, right? <laughs> oh, I mean, the, <laughs> death, the death rate for that's probably, it's probably high. Probably yeah, high. yeah, exactly. We don't, yeah. we don't, we don't publicise it, right? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. bury the numbers. We don't, we don't talk about the numbers. Yeah. Right? The number of people have died on North Connects. Mm. Don't publish it, do we? So... I mean, things like that, things are changing in the profession. Um, it's obviously constantly evolving. And then for you personally, you've had changes, family, um, having a kid now. So yep. is, that, is that really what's prompted the change in your focus? Like what's kind of the focus now? Well, yeah, I was at the point where I, I didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd done a lot of stuff. I've achieved, I achieved a lot of things I wanted to achieve in the sport. Um, having kids was a big game changer for me. And... You know, I started working with people that 
of you know quite intelligent with the headspace, the mental side of things, and um, I took like I think I took about twelve months off, like a year off, where I kind of sat back and just evaluated what, what why was I doing it, um, you know, and and worked on decision making, um, and the reflection part was a big big one for me, just writing things down that I'd done in the past because I hadn't stopped, yeah. I hadn't stopped for for almost ten years, um, I was going just hard and. You know, people would be like, oh my God, that was amazing. And it wouldn't even register. I'd be like, you know, what, what's this guy talking about? I want the next thing. Like, yeah, yeah you just, I just wanted to yeah. keep going further yeah. and further. And it's only until when you actually stop, you can realize, oh shit, like, you know, that was great. Or I can, real, I can understand what's happening now. Mm. But um, until you do reflect and, and slow down and take it in, it's pretty hard to make any sort of change, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's what I got from that. And now it's, it's you know, I've got nothing to prove. I'm enjoying the trips a lot more. Um, you know, sponsors at the time were putting a lot of pressure on us too. Yeah, I was about to say, what's been the, um, the go with your attitude towards sponsorship and things like that? Um, the biggest thing for me was I felt kind of trapped at the end of that, of that period. Um, you know, I had a corporate sponsor, <laughs> Monster Energy, that, you know, they were putting a lot of heat on me to, you know, obviously perform for the money that they were spending on us and stuff like that. Um, now I've obviously I've come to a realization that it's not good to align yourself with uh, people that aren't going in the same direction as you. So I, I kind of looked at that. I wanted to structure things around the industry and what I love, but not put so much pressure on receiving an income from a sponsor. Mm. So I worked on hardware sort of stuff, boards, um, releasing the foils oil company soon and all that sort of stuff that kind of feels like gives you that freedom where you're not trapped like you don't have to keep going forth with this um, and since I've done that I felt like I've gotten a better result yeah, yeah I'm not getting crate like the same money as what I used to but I'm enjoying myself a lot more and um, my performance level is getting better yeah, awesome. um, decisions are clearer and um, I think I've made it a lot safer too. You know, I won't go away unless I've got um, someone that I know can save us with a defibrillator. Um, I've got my own team, safety team. I've got two guys that come away with us. Um, I've got a media team. So when I go away, I make sure that everything's actually getting documented so it's not a waste of time. Um, I used to go away and just be like, I, I don't really care. away, <laughs> no one saw it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so just making the trips count and that sort of thing, and taking a bit more of a professional approach to it. And um, yeah, it's definitely, you know, obviously helping. Do you think that will leave a bit of a legacy in the industry from now on, that kind of Yeah, my, well, my passion is to, to do more specialty events. Uh, that's what I want to give back to the sport. And um, you know, it's such an interesting thing, you know, people are really intrigued with big waves and people mm. surfing them. Um, you know, I don't think people really care too much that don't know about surfing when you see someone on a wave this big um, and doing tricks and stuff, it does, it's not very, you can't relate to it much, but you can relate to seeing a huge wave and someone riding it. So I'd like to see that sport progress and, and especially get bigger in Australia. Yeah. Um, something that you mentioned just before was you took the time to reflect on your decision making process and that you um, not only reflected that, but had a bit of a process that you follow now. I guess that's yeah. something that we can definitely relate to because we're making decisions in all parts of our life, everyone does. Is there something just, you can offer on that? Yeah, just getting really clear on your goals and the, decision ha the decisions have to align with those goals. And if they don't align with it, then obviously, you know, ask yourself, you know, why, why am I doing this, you know? Is it aligned with my goals? How's it going to, for me, it was how's it going to affect my, my uh, family? Yeah. Obviously, was a big one. Um, and then, you know, obviously, I think the goals for me were huge because once they're clear, then you don't get dragged in different directions. Mm. If you don't have goals and you're just like, oh, yeah, I want to be a world champ, but, you know, I, I think that might work, then you're all over the shop. We're probably just relying more on habits, I suppose, than yeah, exactly. conscious decision-making to get there. Yeah, yeah. so for me, 
writing it all down was, was a big part of, of that. And, um, and just being clear and, and backing yourself with the decisions instead of second guessing yourself, you know? So yeah, that was a big one for me. Uh, I, I heard years ago um, in a management context, the definition of control or a definition of control, just think about it really simply. Think about a tap in a bath, like a mixer. And you think about the ability to be able to start something, to pause, to change it, to recommence, and then stop. And I'm kind of interested, if you think about control, you've got much more control. I don't know if you noticed, but in the clip there, the first clip, Ryan's got a breathing, was it like a breathing tank piece? And it wasn't connected? Well, to yeah, so, so I'm sorry, I, I got off track. But yeah, so once, once you've made that decision, for me it's a process. Like, I've got the same visualization that I do on the plane. I've got the same music that I listen to. Um, you know, I, I count every piece of food I put in my mouth. I know exactly what calories I'm, I'm at. Um, if, I'm, if it's before an event, I'll load up more on carbs. Um, I've got supplements that I take on time. I've got um, all the way down to when I rock up to the location, I'll give myself 25 minutes exactly and I'll, I'll be in the water no matter what the conditions are like um, just all these little processes that i take mm -hmm. is performing at your best level and, and it works like it's a it's crazy like <laughs> someone the guy i work with told me to do this and i laughed at him <laughs> you're tripping like, it doesn't work and i've done all the little things the visualization was a huge part of it but like writing the plan out before i went on a mission just helped tenfold. And it literally happened. Like the way I read it down, I came back and looked at it and it was exactly the, the way I planned it. Do you feel like that's more than of like a, it's a lifestyle, it's a well-being piece. So your work is completely integrated with your lifestyle and your well-being instead of like a, yeah. the way you eat, the way you show up, the everything you're doing inside of hours, outside of hours, it's all for that kind of one goal. That was more performance based. Yeah, okay. Like I don't do that for everything. Yeah. You know, if I've got an event at Jaws and I want to win it, that's how far I'll go yeah. to make sure I'm planned and I'm working at the optimal level. If I done that every day, I'd be a nut job. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> there's no point. Yeah. You know, you've got to give yourself some leeway, but um, you know, when I was in my 20s, I, I didn't train, I didn't eat good, I didn't really care. And decisions were just up in the air. But when you get older, there's younger guys coming up that are better than me. Mm. But I've got to outsmart them and I've got to make sure I'm at my best level to compete with them. And that's, that's just around knowledge and, and being smarter. Mm. And the ego is a huge part. I was ego driven when I was younger. Once you lose that ego and you strip everything back, then you have to rely on that process to get you through those situations. Because yeah, relying off an ego only lasts so long. So do you think that you had stripped the ego when you had your comeback for that big wave? <laughs> I don't yeah, know. yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, when I got to, you know, the late stages and especially after that, you know, the ego was damaged because mm. <laughs> I thought I was, you know, I thought I was un untouchable and I, I, I hadn't really had, I hadn't really got hurt that bad before that. But when that happened, yeah, it, it shook me up for a good two years. And yeah, the ego, you, you quickly realise that, um, the ocean's a lot bigger than you and, mm. and it's a life, it's a life sort of uh, skill that I've, I've learnt from the ocean, which is pretty cool. Do we have the comeback clip? Can yeah. I play it? Yeah? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, that's the last video I think we've got on there. But yep. Yep. Cool. Um, at this stage of my career here, I had an option in my contract and basically this was a part of a documentary and I knew if I screwed this up, the three to four year contract was done. Um, I was lucky that I'd done a good job and I'd done that process in this clip. Um, it got 1.3 million views on YouTube and um, got me a four year deal. 
So how long between the last clip when you got messed up and you, you stopped? Is it like two years? Two or years. Yeah. Two okay. years of planning. And you hadn't compete. You didn't. And you didn't compete in that period. No. No sponsor. Didn't compete. My sponsor was on on the edge. Yeah. I hadn't done anything. Right. I hadn't really done much since that wipeout. Okay. It was eighteen months. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was eighteen months. Since Long the time on the bench. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, in their mind, you hadn't been doing anything, but like you just said, you were personally like reflecting. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I was busier than I, I ever been. Ever, yeah. ever yeah. been. Yeah. Planning, training yep. every single day, yep. um, and just putting this stuff into place, and cool. that was the result. Wow. Last time I surfed this wave, I thought oh, I was sorry. gone. Took some water. It almost took my life. The right, it's the most dangerous wave in the world. Where's you never know what you're where dropping into. Right. Where is the old wave, right? and the whole Stop. thing just shuts down. Yeah. The ocean just swallows. So this is the wave we found in Western Australia. It holds you under. It's so big and there's so much water. It can seriously kill you. Coming back to this wave, I knew I had to face it again. I wanted to face it again. I think I would have got back in the water, hey, that's <laughs> pretty daunting to go back to. Did you notice the woman with the uh, blonde ponytail? Yeah. The wife? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure her heart would have just been like, <laughs> That is crazy. Cool, so what's happening now? That, like, what's the career, what's the direction? Um, so I've still got a chance on the Big Wave World Tour. Yep. And just training and implementing those changes and just learning um yeah staying pretty open and just putting everything i've learned into practice and trying to get the first big wave world tour title for australia that's the plan and would that be in tasmania or would that be like um so we don't have a big wave world tour um stop in australia okay. and so it's tasmania mavericks in near san francisco um, and then Jaws, and Naz oh sorry, Nazare in Europe, yeah. So there's only three events, but they're picking up another fourth event the following year. Yeah. When does that kick off? Uh, that will start in November, um, so yeah, soon. Yeah. And, and the waiting period basically goes all the way up till March. Just, so just talk so about that on, for a bit. We're on call, so yeah. basically uh, we're checking weather maps every day um, you know I've gotten really good at understanding what swells do and we've got premium subscriptions to different weather channels and stuff like that and we've got people on call that we ring to get their take on you know what that storm's going to do because we've got to predict it um, like four or five days out we can't just go oh yeah I think it looks good but I'm not sure like um, so yeah it's a, it's a process for sure it's not just hoping that the swell is going to be there and rock up. Yeah. And we've got to be ready for any day, drop of a hat, and uh, they give us an alert 
um, I think it's like four or five days out. And then, um, you know, the process every day up until that point, it's green lit three days out and we go. So. That, that was a Netflix documentary I saw, not just about big waves, but it was yeah. actually about the weather, the, how you guys follow the weather religiously. And yeah. Again, weeks and months out. And yeah, it was yeah, we've got, so I've set up custom alerts on my phone and say if, um, over time too, because a lot of these places in Australia, we, um, you know, we discovered like, it was like a tip off from, you know, um, local fishermen and Trawler fishermen, yeah. um, all that sort of thing. So, you know, we, it was a lot of trial and error. We learnt what that place breaks on, what wind it, um, obviously it works on. We, we learnt what, um, the high pressures do on land, um, the hectopascals, I think, in between yeah, the systems and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's a lot more to it than just rocking up and having a good old time in the ocean. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that goes into it and a lot of planning, heaps of planning. Um, we don't just have jet skis all over the place. You know, we've got to organise that uh, within three days. And then we've got a whole media team. We've got three, four cameramen every time we go. Boats, skis, um, yeah, drones now, thank God. Mm. Helicopters are too expensive. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's kind of the logistics around chasing swallows for a living. Is that where the money is, the footage? That's, the that's the where they justify giving us the money. <laughs> 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 yeah, it is. And that's why that saved my contract at the time because they're like, well, we're paying you to go surf these waves. You've got to document it. You know, we got, we've got budgets and stuff for that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much how they justify. But now that the Big Wave World Tour is there and there's a platform for it, it's, um, it's just another add-on, which is great. And the specialty events that myself and Mark are putting on now as well is all helping progress the sport forward and make it a bit more commercial. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. It's a really good question. <laughs> um, so, it's big, the big wave thing is a bit different. It's you get mo mo yep. Most of these guys wouldn't know anything about <laughs> scoring surfing at all. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's basically out of ten, you ride. You get two. Uh, you scored on two rides. Um, ten being the best, one being the worst. Uh, you've got a forty-five to fifty-minute duration heat. We surf uh, up to four times in a day to get to a final. So um, heat one, quarter semi-final, uh, which is a lot of surfing in one day in these sort of waves. Um, and that's pretty much it. And, and it's five, five man heats. So you judge on, well that's different again. You judge on how critical the wave is, how big it is, what you do on the wave, um, bar a barrel is obviously, oh, sorry, not obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a barrel is when you disappear and then you come shooting out of it. Um, that's huge points because it's, you know, the holy grail of, of any surfer wants to disappear in that thing, the time capsule, and then come spitting out of it. Um, so that's, that's a, yeah, that's a, general gist of how they score it. And you should complete. Well, you, get more really. you get more yeah, points if you complete? You do, you get more points. But the hard thing about competing in the big wave things is if you need a score um, and there's three minutes to go and there's a wave that you know you're not going to make, you're forced to go that wave where you usually wouldn't just to get the score, which is another So you're going to get wiped out, but you you're take it anyway. You're guaranteed to get wiped out, but you might make through the heat. So, yeah, that's yeah another thing where the ego comes in. Mm. You might, I might be happy just to let the heat go and not take a twenty foot wipeout. <laughs> um, so yeah. And the guys judging it like stay in just the back of the top of the wrong bound. Nowhere near. <laughs> no, no. So so it's um they've got it. It's all digital. Um, it's a digital panel. They've got a head judge behind a five panel of judges. And then um, they've got like six or seven different angles. They've got slow motion replays. Um, yeah, they've got pretty much everything that any other sport's got. Um, but yeah, they are judging something. 
that is pretty far away, but they can relate what you've done through the, the live feed, because it is live, it's a live feed. So, yeah. So check it out. <laughs> now you know all about it. <laughs> Other questions from the floor, guys, before we um, move into our workshop here? Yeah, is yeah. it still in contact with the mentor in Hawaii? Uh, yes, I still see him. I haven't missed, oh, actually, I lie, I've missed one season since, um, since that year I went when I was 14. Oh. And um, he's, uh, he'd have to be in his late 60s, and he's, he looks really young and fit, and he's a freak. <laughs> but so super advice to give, yeah, more so on, yeah, he does. A lot of knowledge advice. Not so much tell me you know, what to do in the water, but just life outside the water and just trying to be a better person, I guess. Yeah. It's pretty um, rare we would have. Sorry. Yeah? If you could, could distill down all the various lessons that he gave you, particularly at a young age, which was the one that influenced you the most? Or which is the one that you still remember, like the, the key bit of information he gave you way back when? That's a good question. I don't, I don't think it, it's, I don't think it was one piece of information. I think it was the fact that he was drip feeding me information throughout the two months that I was there. And so it wasn't just like, I'm your mentor, here's, you know, one piece of information that's really going to help you for the rest of your life as a big wave surfer. It was purely, I was out of my depth, big time. I was 14 and I was, he knew that I came in and, you know, thought I had a, a handle on things. I was getting good results. There was a lot of hype around us as a junior going over there. And then as soon as I was there, I was like a deer in headlights. Um, so he, he knew it, like he knew, he looked at me, he's like, okay, like I, I understand where you're at. Um, you know, he does that Molokai paddle. It's one of the biggest, uh, most famous stand-up paddle boarding and, and long distance races. He d he's done that for the last 20 something years. Um, you know, he's, he's a carpenter, so he works. And you know, so he's, he's, not just, he's not just a surfer. And so I kind of, um, yeah. I, I, to answer your question, I think it was more so the fact that um, he had a lot of knowledge to give over a, a long period of time. But I can't remember one piece of information that really stood out to answer your question. But, but interestingly, it was probably available, <coughs> accessible, and Ryan resonated with him, maybe. Yeah, so maybe in some ways that's kind of the, the he, did you initiate the relationship with him or did he initiate it with you? Um, I think it was a mutual thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was. I was staying downstairs of his house, right? Um, but I met him out in the surf, and then th that's how the relationship kind of came about. Um, I actually met him after I had a, I thought was a near death experience. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was my first week there, and I was about to pack my bags and go home. Um, and he's like, "No, just stay. You know, there's no rush. You've got two months. Why are you going home?" Sort of thing. And yeah, just kind of. I, I guess looking back at it, you know, when I was about to leave and he, you know, obviously coming in in a calm nature mm. and just going, no, you, you don't have to go, you know, was, you know, I could have easily went and then probably never come back mm. and then I wouldn't have had a surfing career because if you, if you don't, if you're nothing in Hawaii, there's no point of even pursuing a career in surfing. Mm. Hmm. Cool. Any other quick questions, guys? Just a quick one. Um, in regard to the incident where you nearly drowned and um, sort of turned your life all around and you're telling the water. Yeah. Um, hypothetically, if that didn't happen and you're still an ego driven person, yeah. how would you think you could pull yourself out of it another way? I honestly, <laughs> I feel like things obviously happen for a reason. And the drowning thing was just an excuse for me to implement that change quicker. It was going to happen, and it was happening already. My performance level was going to shit, and every time I see a swell, I get so frantic and so fearful of it and the decision around it. But I still had this ego here that was like, everyone was like, "Oh, you're doing so good, you know, you're the man." Like, and so I felt like I was obligated to go there.
but the change, like, it was driving me nuts to answer your question. I was just, it got to a point where I, I just wanted to quit. And I think if, if that didn't happen and I didn't put the, play, the things into place, I probably would have just walked away from the sport. So I think the drowning thing was just a good excuse to go, oh, I nearly drowned. It rattled the shit out of me and now I've got to implement that change. And that's when I got the right people involved. And, and looking back at it, I don't think it was just the drowning. I think it was more so the fact that it was just the timing. It got to that point where, the, where it had to happen. The drowning thing was just, I think it was just a good excuse to make it happen quicker. So it would be the excuse that the sponsors would accept and that, and that your peers around you that were probably pushing you on. Yeah, exactly. And cracked and it was a, a it, was, it was a perfect way to just go, oh yeah, but I nearly drowned, so it's yeah. fine if I walk away. Yeah, I just skunk out, yeah. But without that, it, it, it would have been harder because they would be like, you're not giving up, well, what are you doing? You know, you, you just won this award, you won 50 grand, why are you walking away? You're only 28, there's guys in their 40s that are still at the top of their, their game in the, big, in the big wave scene. So, yeah, I think that drowning for sure definitely was a great excuse, for sure. Yeah. Because you gotta, you gotta remember in the surfing world, it's like, there's a lot of full on, um, personalities and so that whole macho thing and speaking your mind doesn't really fly too well <laughs> um, especially in Australia so yeah not very similar to the business world is it <laughs> yeah. just think about think about workplace conditions harassment the uh, Royal Commission think about all that sort of stuff and you, you think about the, well, the, the, the interesting use of the term excuse right mm -hmm. You listen, Ryan, you, and, and a catalyst or a, a, a pivot point, and you go, whether it's safety and mining, it, it doesn't matter, or what, uh, you know, uh, gen, gender, the, the, you know, equity and gender uh, balance and decency in the workplace. They're all, you sit there and, you, and p people get carried away with keeping on going and not putting their hand up and going, hey, there's something wrong here. So yeah. the, the drowning was your reason to go, hey, there's something wrong here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then obviously, like, now the change of, changes have been implemented I don't even I won't even touch or go near someone that's got any sort of negative take or outlook with where I want to go you know, I'd, I'd probably turn out a, a bigger deal or a sponsorship deal if they were trying to put that sort of pressure on me that I had when I was going through that stuff um, you know, in my mid-twenties because it's just not where I want to be um, and I think once you've been in that, you realise there's a bigger picture. So. Any other quick questions? Otherwise, we might roll onto the the work session piece. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Was there anything anything burning? Uh, you're going to have access to to. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Because I'm married to a surfer, a small legged surfer. <laughs> <laughs> what is about four foot? <laughs> It's, um, it's really hard, like going into the event space, of under I understand why it's not bigger. It, it's, it's really hard to go to someone like Fox or something like that and go, look, oh yeah, we've got this event, but it might not run. Mm. They're like, what do you mean it might not run? We need to run at this time yeah. at seven o'clock. Yeah. Otherwise, well, what are you talking about? Mm. I'm like, no, that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> like we've got a three month window and there's a potential that it doesn't run. And if it runs, it's over a million bucks to, to put it on. So it's pretty hard to get that sort of stuff over the line with a commercial company where someone's head's on the chopping block because they're like, well, I'm not putting my name to this. I'm going to get fired for it. But, um, you know, there is companies out there and obviously Red Bull's and a good one. And there's other platforms too. If you just have to rely on 
Or, no, exactly. You know, so maybe one day. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, I'm in talks with the guys from Fox at the moment to try to work out a live broadcasting platform instead of making it so much around a competition. Yeah. So people can just log on and actually watch what happens on these days. And, um, and obviously Fox has that platform to potentially do that. Yeah. So exciting stuff, I think, for the sport for sure. Yeah, so you can tell your husband. husband. Tell your husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully the, the uh, Cape Fear event in Tassie will run. Yeah, yeah. yeah soon because yeah. we're in that waiting period right now, so it could happen any day. Yeah. yeah. So if we change gears, guys, um, I th we thought sort of the last sort of forty-five odd minutes we might just dive in and just focus on resilience first, and then then well-being. Um, just interested, Ryan, if you without making a definition. If you think about resilience, you know, you, in some ways it's a summary of some of the stuff that you've spoken about yeah. before, but you know, what, what are some of the, the, the planks or the pieces? When you think about resilience, you, you, the article, this section, was you might have seen originally represented as well-being and resilience. That was the way it was published in the beginning of the year. And we sat down talking to mm -hmm. Ryan and he said, well, that's the wrong way around. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you can't have well-being unless you've got resilience. I'm going, that's very logical, thank you. You're just like, what? Yeah, oh. so, so <laughs> you know, ipso facto, someone that understands resilience, right? But what do you, what do you see as the, the sort of the, the you know, how would you explain resilience to someone? Maybe it's a good way to think about it. Well, I kind of touched on that before around it being like a lifelong journey. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had to be resilient because in my line of work, it changes so quickly. It's not something that's structured. I've got no structure in my life at all. I don't even know what I'm doing in two or three days' time, which, you know, it's hard to get used to. Mm. Um, I could have the best year of my, of my life in surfing and get fired, yep. which is fucking hard. <laughs> Imagine going to work and killing it and going, I'm going to get a bonus, and the guy goes, see you later. <laughs> I've been through that three or four times. Yeah. Um, so... You know, it's, yeah, I've had to be resilient to keep going. And I think the only thing that's allowed me to do that is, you know, the, the, the love and passion that I've got for what I do. If I didn't have that, um, you know, the resilience thing, you know, I don't know. It's, it's important, but I think there's other elements that comes with it. Okay. Um, so, task question for you at the table. So, Ryan's going to, for this first session, Ryan's going to spend about 10 minutes here at this table and 10 minutes at that table. Um, I guess the question is, just be think nice. about it. What was that? I was saying be nice. Yeah, yeah, be, yeah, be, be nice to him. Um, just think about, you know, you guys are into your project piece now. Um, just think about, you're going to go under a lot of stress, right? How long have you had the brief? Four weeks? So, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Right. So, you've got another, you know, four or five weeks, you're juggling families kids, jobs, maybe. Um, so just think about two things as a table, some, some things that, or initiatives that you could actually take as a team over the next eight weeks, because you're gonna need resilience, right? Over the next eight weeks, you're gonna need plenty of resilience. So just talk at, at the table about um, what it is that you reckon um, might be one or two things that you might do to, to improve the resilience of the team over these next eight weeks. So Ryan's gonna sit with you, so you don't need to focus wholly and solely on it, but it's an opportunity for you to sit one on five um, across the next 20 minutes. So next 20 minutes, just try and come up with two initiatives you think from a resilience are going to help you act, act, you know, be more resilient as a team as you under, undergo that workload. Be a bit creative with it as well, guys. Like you've obviously heard Ryan say already a couple of the techniques that he draws on for, for resilience. Um, you know, think about it a little bit differently and try and draw on, on Ryan's experience to get a little bit out of context. It's not always uh, resilience in a boardroom. Uh, you can use some of those different techniques and place them into this context for the team as well. So we'll give you 20 minutes. We'll give you a, a warning at 10. And Ryan's going to start at that table and move to that table. And then we get onto wellbeing. He'll sit across those back two tables. Alrighty, off you go, guys. You guys get each table to just give us a quick snapshot of a couple of ideas they came up with. Might just start here with. <laughs> Yeah. So we're going to do the second piece in a minute, but we'll get you a, a, a pizza in a mission. Just All right, guys, listen one, up. One, one, one conversation down here. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, we had two. So the first one was do something fun every now and then. So I get tunnel vision and keep perspective um, on what we're trying to achieve. Yep. Um, and then the second one was plan out 
our objectives and also our expectations for what, what we're trying to achieve as a group and then stick to it. Yeah, pretty simple, isn't it? Go and have fun. You might have seen in one of the early clips there was an ex-military guy with a whole bunch of golf clubs. Yeah, and he just took them playing golf two, three times during the project. So I don't think they like golf. You may not like surfing, right? But just do, do something together just to blow some steam. No, I like that. It touches on what Ryan was saying earlier on um, how important it was to have a goal. Like, have a goal and then work towards the goal. So have your objectives, stick with it. Like, that's kind of exactly what he was saying. Mind you, we celebrate pretty hard after these big events. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not all serious. <laughs> awesome. Okay, around this table at the front. Um, so we had sort of a discussion around um, you know, getting to know each other better, um, but also in the need to spend effort and time to achieve that, we need to be respectful of each different member's actual work-life balance and actually achieving that. We're not all members have the same work-life balance already. Mm -hmm. um, so some yeah. people are already over. Yep. And I think the best way to do that is to be able to talk about it as a team yep. and work out where those stresses lie so we can navigate them appropriately. I yep. understand. But I reckon that translates um, not just new project teams but to work places as well. After hours working, I'm sure we've all been there. Not everyone does it. Yeah. Uh, social lives, yeah, we've all got our different circumstances. So that's really good. How does that relate, mate? Just thinking about what these guys talk about, respecting the fact that not everybody's got 24 hours a day. Other people have got other, both other priorities, but other pursuits. Yeah, I can I can see it. Like, there's definitely a correlation there with, you know, um, even though we're worlds apart, there there is some parallels there for sure. Like your wife, arguably at home looking after your children when you're <laughs> gallivanting around the world, theoretically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We won't ever. <laughs> yeah, don't go there. <laughs> In theory, there. of course. Yeah. Um, back to Tim's table. What did you guys chat about, Tim? We sort of had a chat about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we sort of had a chat about enjoying the process. Um, and I think that was a really good You, you were nodding when he, he talked about enjoying the process. Sorry, what's your name? Chris. Chris. Chris is talking about enjoying yeah. the process. Just yeah, well, that's a big, big one for me now, you know, is you have to stop to realise, you know, where you're going, was what I was saying. And I think I spent like eight, eight years of my surfing career not even liking it. And looking back at that now, I'm just like, how can you surf for a living and not even enjoy it? <laughs> but you can't and that's not you know that's just you know not enjoying the process and setting an expectation that's way too high because when you do that you just you just always fighting to get to that expectation that is too high and you're just always going to be disappointed yeah Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think if you enjoy the process, it's easier. It's not hard. I, f I found it was getting harder and harder the longer that I left it, which is wild. But now I'm doing the same thing and it's easy. I don't, I don't find it. It doesn't feel like a job anymore. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And the last time? It's a hard one to relate to. <laughs> These things back yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's all well and good to say I'm going to do this, but if you don't have the guts to stand up and do it, then you're not going to get anywhere. So at least if you've got that guts to give it a go, yeah. it's the worst that can happen. Yeah. Failure is an option. Yeah. Just yeah. learn from it. Yeah. yeah. That's the bit that yeah, gets you coming back, like backing yourself. You know, you, you're going to get knocked down, I suppose, but it's like, nah, let's do it again. Back yourself, keep going. Yeah. yeah. Understand. Well, 
the best yeah the best guys in our sport I don't think they're I think there's a lot of us that are very similar in ability but you can see the ones that really love themselves and back themselves generally the, the guys from America but but they do they love themselves and they back themselves and generally their outcomes are better it's not an Australian way but that's what they do and I think if we can take a little bit from well, I know if I could, when I take a little bit from them um, and start backing myself and enjoying it and, and giving myself props um, then the performance level creeps up I'm not, yeah so but yeah you definitely have to back yourself it's an interesting comparison culturally isn't it it's not very pleasant to hear I have to say but I, I, I haven't agree with you yeah, but I, I actually don't mind failing. I love p proving people wrong, but I definitely don't mind failing. Yeah. yeah. Did, was you like that when you were 23? Uh, you were a hated failure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't an option. <laughs> <laughs> now it's an option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Learn to love it. Awesome. Resilience. Um, all right, so next session focuses on well-being rather than the resilience. Same thing though, we're going to be working in our, in our groups and coming up with a couple of ideas. So this time, um, I guess touching on the fact that resilience leads to well-being, and so they are two distinct concepts and that means that the techniques that you can do to build them are going to be slightly different. That's not to say that the, the themes and the techniques that you came up with in your groups for resilience can't lead to your discussion now around well-being. Um, Time permitted, we're going to have Ryan, oh, he definitely will, come around to the back three tables, so kind of five minutes each table. Um, you'll get your one-on-one -on -one time with him. But the idea being that the discussion is around coming up with some well-being techniques this time, and if you can, to get three of them. So one for the workplace, one in your project teams, and then one just for yourself personally, because well-being for you might look completely different than what it would look like in your team or in your workplace. So, Three things, well-being focus, workplace, project team, individual. Go. <laughs>